Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar um, in our autumn schedule. Um, we're delighted with the response to the webinar this morning, and we hope you enjoy the, the webinar that's coming up. This morning's webinar is called The Abuse of Older People, and it's been hosted by Our Glass uh, in partnership with um, Telford and Rican Safeguarding Partnership, Shropshire Safeguarding Community Partnership, and Shropshire Partners in Care. My name is Sarah Brown, and I'm one of the trustees on the board of Our Glass. And um, for anyone who doesn't know, Our Glass is uh, a UK wide charity, and our mission is very simple to put a stop to the harm, abuse and exploitation of older people um, in the UK. Um, we were formerly known, and some of you may be more familiar with, we were formerly known as Action on Elder Abuse, and we look forward to celebrating our 30th anniversary next May. Um, but the work that we do is now more important than ever, um, even after 30 years, to raise awareness of the abuse of older people and to create, to work with others, like-minded um, organisations and, and folk who want to create um, a society where older people are valued, where they can age safely and where they can live free from harm. In the UK, it's reckoned about 2.7 million people over the age of 65 are affected by abuse every year. And that's quite staggering in that that's about one in six older people. So the need to raise awareness um, across all, all parts of society is, is very important. Um, in our class, we run a 24-7 helpline, which is the only dedicated elder abuse helpline in the UK, offering support to older people who have been um, affected by abuse and their families, and to provide a casework service. As you all probably know, this is Safeguarding Adults Week, which is running from the 21st to the 27th of November. And as part of Safeguarding Adults Week, there's a theme for every day. And it's appropriate, I think, that today's theme is elder abuse. So this morning, through our webinar, we're hoping to raise awareness um, of the prevalence of abuse and to enable organizations and individuals to feel confident to be able to recognize the, the, the different types of abuse and more importantly, to feel confident to report any safeguarding concerns that they might have or that they might come across. In a few minutes, um, I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce this, themselves. And this morning, I'm really pleased that we have Michelle Williams from Shropshire Safeguarding Community Partnership, Karen Littleford from Shropshire Partners in Care, and Elizabeth Fox, who is the co-founder of Nightingale's Army, and indeed one of our community response officers within our glass. But before I ask the panelists to introduce themselves and their organizations, and perhaps say a little bit about um, their background, I just want to advise everyone that this morning's webinar is being recorded and will be available to download from our Knowledge Bank website um, after the event. And if anyone has any questions as the seminar progresses, um, please feel free to pop them into the question and answer box and we will try to answer those questions as we go through the webinar but if we can't we will try to follow up after the event with an answer to any questions raised. So with that um, I would like to hand over uh, first to Michelle um, if you would like to introduce yourself and um, say a little bit about your background. Thank you. Um, morning everybody so I'm Michelle Williams I'm a service manager for adult social care um, I've been a social worker for 15 years um, with, in Shropshire Council that whole time. Um, I've worked in safeguarding as a safeguarding practitioner. 
um, and as a senior as well. Um, and currently um, I'm in an interim service manager post that manages a team um, in the North Shropshire area of adult social care um, and have oversight of our safeguarding team at the moment as their service manager. Thank you, Michelle. And Karen, if we could, if you could introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here today to raise awareness of the issue of the abuse of older people. Uh, my role is Adult Safeguarding Lead for Shropshire Partners in Care. And Shropshire Partners in Care is a not-for-profit organisation. We are based in Shropshire and Salford and Rekin, and we represent approximately 240 independent adult social care providers, so nursing homes, residential supported living, domiciliary care in the Telford and Rekin and Shropshire area. And we also have uh, within our membership housing providers and a number of charities as well. The services we provide at Shropshire Partners in Care are training, uh, disclosure and barring service uh, services, workforce interaction and um, development around things like recruitment and retention and all kinds of other things. And our overall aim really is to make sure that our sector is providing good quality services um, to adults. My work background before I came to Shropshire Partners in Care was working with looked after children, adults with learning disabilities and older people. Thanks Sarah. Thanks Karen and then um, Elizabeth if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you Sarah. Good morning everybody. My name is Elizabeth. I'm one of the independent domestic violence advocates for Hourglass. I'm based in the Community Response Hub in the south of England. Um, my previous history and experience is in the health and social care sector. I spent 10 years working as a care assistant across various sectors um, within the hospital, care homes, you name it, I've done it. Um, so I've got a lot of experience working with older people, their family, friends, raising safeguardings and concerns as well. So really happy to be here today and looking forward to the webinar ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. And then, Elizabeth, are you doing a presentation for us? I am indeed, yes. Would you like me to hop straight into that? We want to go into that. Yeah, thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you. I will bring it up on the screen now. If there are any technical difficulties or anything, please do just shout out. Lovely, wonderful. So yes, as we're here today, part of the Adult Safeguarding Week, um, we're here to discuss safeguarding as part of the Shropshire County Council um, partnership. So thank you for being here today. For our viewers that are watching today and anybody that may download this at a later date, safeguarding is the protection of the health and well-being and rights of vulnerable individuals. Um, what do we mean when we say a vulnerable individual? Well, a vulnerable individual is somebody who falls into the protected characteristics. And these protected characteristics are age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion or belief and sex. As a charity, we assist those over 60 who are experiencing harm, abuse and neglect, but that is not the only protected characteristic we support. Our clients may be married, part of the LGBTQ plus community, and it is really important for us to know about our clients in detail so we can find the correct support for them. I want to take a moment to explain some of the various helpline calls we receive and the cases that we support on a daily basis. So you can see here, these are just a few of the um, cases and abuse types that we support here at Hourglass. And these statistics are taken UK based. So domestic abuse in 2021, 705 of our cases related to domestic abuse. But in the year to date 2022, 1,169 of our cases are relating to domestic abuse. These are usually raised by a family member or friend who may be concerned about an individual. They may have noticed their adult child or partner being abusive towards them, or they may have said something that concerns them. We offer advice and support over the phone to deal with these cases, or they will be triaged into one of our community response hubs. Financial abuse in 2021, 1,274 of our cases related to financial abuse, and in the year to date, 1,624 of our cases are relating to financial abuse. And again, these are usually raised by a relative or close friend. Financial abuse tends to be perpetrated from an adult child to a parent and can include coercive and psychological control with underlying threats of, I won't let you see the grandkids if you don't buy me this or I will have no heating and hot water and it's your fault. The cost of living. In the year to date, uh, we have had 134 cases relevant to the cost of living. And of course, this is only a very recent crisis that's come to our attention. And we've had to take into consideration the negative effects this is having on older people. The fear around cost of living can lead to self-neglect in forms of not heating their home or using cooking utilities. They may have a family member making them feel guilty about the cost of living and using coercive tactics to financially abuse them. 
sexual. In 2021, 65 of our cases were related to sexual abuse. And in the year to date, 94 of our cases have been reported to us as sexual abuse. And although an over 65 year old, the general stereotype means that an older person may not be desirable, this does not mean they are excluded from that type of abuse. Coercive control. In 2021, 442 of our cases related to coercive control, and in the year to date, 724 of our cases are relating to coercive control. Within the community, sponsor, um, community response hubs, these cases can mean we are supporting our clients to safety plan, raise safeguarding and referrals into other agencies, or apply for an injunction and even support them through the court process. Neglect. In 2021, 731 of our cases related to neglect, and in the year to date, 948 of our cases are rela relating to neglect. It can be really hard to identify neglect due to the nature of the abuse. The individual may be cut off from accessing services, or a relative may be reporting that the individual is safe and well, but in fact this just is not the case. Neglect of another person is terribly isolating and scary for that individual. So what is it we can do to safeguard our callers on the helpline and our clients in the community response hubs? We can call the police or other emergency services. If our caller requires immediate medical service or personnel attendance, we can make that call for them. We have found that callers may not be inclined to call the police due to fear of repercussions from their perpetrator. It may often be better for an individual if the service calls on their behalf as it reduces the risk posed to the victim or they may have lost faith in the service due to the ongoing abuse that they have experienced and believe that there is no one there to help them. We can raise a safeguarding referral for cases where there may be an ongoing concern of abuse to a vulnerable individual who cannot protect or care for themselves and who requires the assistance of another service to support their needs, we would make a safeguarding referral. And this would usually be discussed with the client, done on consent and less deemed reasonable to do otherwise. We refer into the client's council through the safeguarding referral system. For example, on the Shropshire Council, you can access information with safeguarding through the social care and health tab in the menu. <clears throat> there you will find information on adult and childcare referrals. We can agree to a safety plan. Our callers are given advice to make an educated decision on what they wish to do in their case. We would never tell someone to leave or put them in a situation where they make them feel more at risk. Each case is unique, and we find that the victim may not want to leave for a variety of reasons, one of them being not wanting to leave their animals with the perpetrator. We will work with callers to agree on a safety plan, discuss safe exit routes, or a safe place in the house to reside if an incident occurs. Here in the Community Response Hub, we offer all of our clients across the south of England the Safe Space Sussex app, developed by Sussex Police. Multi-agency working. Confidentially sharing data and liaising with other agencies involved to ensure everybody is working collaboratively, collaboratively and there is no duplicated work. Having regular meetings to um, update on the case and work openly and discuss the options available for the clients and who is best to lead on that action. Multi-agency working can also be Marux Multi-Agency Risk Assessment Conference or a MASH Multi-Agency Safeguarding Hub as well as other partner meetings that can be considered multi-agency working, all of this contributes to the service being able to provide the best support available for the individual. And signposting to other organisations. Signposting is really important as the clients we assist may have varying requirements such as accessibility needs, they may require a translator or part of the LGBTQ plus community. And there are so many amazing services out there that can offer this personalised support unique to the individual. It's really necessary for their journey. So why is there a need to safeguard older people? Because through our research, we have found one in five people did not see pushing, beating or hitting an older person as abuse. One in four did not see taking money from an older relative's bank account or precious items from their home as abuse. And on social media, on Twitter, animal abuse was mentioned six times as much as the abuse of an older person. And out of over 500,000 tweets, 0.3 referenced older people. You can find out more about these statistics on our website in our last in line report. So what are we going to do to change this? Our work within Hourglass, as Sarah has already kindly mentioned, we have our national service on the left hand side there with our 24 seven helpline. We also have our website with information support, our knowledge bank, which is a region specific um, knowledge bank that you can use You can pop on and see what's available in your area and support for a client near you. 
locally within the community response hubs, we are an additional support to the helpline where cases will be triaged and we can support and provide that localised expertise with the independent domestic abuse, abuse advocacy service as well, where we'll be focusing on elder domestic abuse. We have our safer ageing service where we'll be working with individuals and the community to create an environment for safer ageing and as well as our community hubs and drop in sessions where we have a location for staff and volunteers to work and meet with clients and it'll be a base for our community activities and other services and programmes will be developed there. We have all of our contact details here which I'm sure will be shared out at the end of the webinar so please do get in touch if you have any queries or questions. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, uh, for that comprehensive overview, um, both of the um, types of abuse and what we are actually seeing coming through on the helpline in our glass. So I think that um, gives a lot of food for thought as we go forward into questions. And we have a number of questions which um, have already been sent in. But as I said earlier, if as we go through this morning's webinar, there is something that um, comes to mind that you'd like to ask, please do put it into the, the question and answer box and we will try to get to it during the webinar. If I could maybe start um, then by asking and just to forewarn, uh, I'm going to come to Michelle and then to Karen. Um, how does what, what Elizabeth has outlined in what we're seeing nationally, because obviously Elizabeth wasn't in her presentation, breaking that down by nation or by region. She was giving an overview of what we see coming through the helpline. But um, can you maybe it's, give us some idea of what types of abuse um, are coming through within Shropshire and what are the the prevalent types of abuse that you're seeing coming through um, your, your various safeguarding partnerships? Michelle, if you would like to, to start. Okay, so we do see all types of abuse coming through for older people, um, all of the ones that Liz has mentioned in her presentation. Um, the main ones though, there is a trend where there are two main types that our, our highest referrals are, which is domestic abuse and self-neglect. Um, domestic abuse, a lot of the time, involves individuals where they've either got disabilities or maybe cognitive impairments, living with a family member um, and no longer or not able to um, support themselves or keep themselves safe. So a referral is often made by, um, it could be somebody visiting the home, it could be a neighbour that's, that's mentioned that's seen some concerns or has heard um, some sort of worrying noise coming from a property. Um, and then self-neglect is a big area that we're seeing a huge rise of in Shropshire. Um, a lot of the time relating to hoarding as well. Um, within a property, uh, which means that the home isn't always habitable, that they're living in quite um, extreme poor conditions where they may not be able to access a bathroom or a kitchen area, so they can't access hot water and uh, facilities to cook for themselves. Um, as Liz mentioned in her presentation, with the rising cost of living as well, we're seeing more and more people choosing to not eat hot food, not heat their homes. So their health is severely impacted by that. So they're self-neglecting their health and you know, how they're caring for themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's definitely rising. And I think as we've also come in out of the COVID pandemic, there's a real trend at the moment in relation to neglecting care homes. Um, I'm sure really why that is, possibly because for a long time over the COVID pandemic, care homes weren't having regular visitors from professionals or family members. So there was a lack of oversight of the care that they were delivering. Um, but we're seeing a rise in the number of people with pressure sores that are living in care homes or staying in care homes temporarily. So a lot of um, institutional type abuse that's coming through as well. 
Um, and there, there, that, there's definitely a real trend of that the last 12 months, definitely, as we've come out of the pandemic. Okay, Michelle, that's very interesting. Can I ask just in terms of, because it's interested to hear you saying that there's been a rise in the number of self-neglect cases and um, particularly, you know, over the past 12 months and particularly around hoarding. And and I'm, I'm just interested to know what support through safeguarding are you able to, to offer someone in that position or their family because I mean it must be very very difficult for fa if where people have families to see that and feel that there's nothing that they can do to make the situation better for their, their the older person that um, is living in, th in that condition. Of course and it is you're absolutely right Sarah and a lot of the time individuals that self-neglect are very difficult to engage with they often don't recognise that they need the help. Um, they, you often get the, the conversation with them that go and help somebody that really needs it, I'm okay. Because they get used to living in that sort of situation and it becomes normal for them. And they often don't recognise that, you know, they, they are in the poor condition, you know, that they're not looking after themselves. Um, and they are very notoriously difficult to engage with. So. The first point of call would be obviously to talk to them about how would they like our help? You know, if we can help them, how can we do that? It often entails a lot of involvement. So developing the relationship with them so that they do start to recognize that they need support and how we can support them. Um, one thing that we do is offer a Care Act assessment to see if they've got um, eligible Care Act needs and then we may help them to identify how we can meet those needs with for that individual such as maybe having some support within the house to cook for themselves and help with personal care. Other times it might just be helping them identify what the problem could be. Now a lot especially in relation to hoarding it's now um, recognised as a mental health issue. So a lot of the time people that hoard have got deep rooted mental health concerns that can date back to childhood, you know, attachment disorders potentially, and they're difficult to address um, and, and to turn things around quickly and improve a situation quickly for an individual. So quite often it's a long piece of work that a social worker will develop a relationship with them. We signpost them to services that could help, such as Hourglass, you know, where they could get some support to maybe advocacy services, that somebody independent, because quite often there's that stigma that people don't want support from social services, especially in the elderly population. People can be quite proud. And they're um, quite stoic and believe that they can manage and cope fine on their own without support. So sometimes it's about getting the right services in place, not necessarily social services. So as I said, advocacy, advocacy where they're independent and they can work with the individual to look at ways that they can improve their situation at home. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Um, and Karen, if really ask the same question to you in terms of um, are there any particular trends that you're seeing within your own organisation in relation to the the types of abuse presenting? Yeah it's an interesting question from my perspective because obviously we're an independent um, provider membership organisation so we don't necessarily gather data ourselves but we work really closely with Shropshire Council and Telford and Reakin Council to look at the data and alongside the Care Quality Commission and I have to say um, across our area we've got lots and lots of really well rated and respected care providers so and I think that's really you know down to them putting a lot of hard work in particularly during the pandemic but we have got roles within our organisation as well offering specific support support around things like you know moving and handling first aid training and all that kind of thing but also quite a lot of clinical input so we have a clinical practice lead who's leading on a project at the moment looking at things including things like hydration 
which is relevant to some of the things that Michelle was talking about earlier. So there's lots of really good positive work going on to support our sector to provide really good quality services. And I guess from a Talford and Rekin perspective, Talford and Rekin, in terms of the safeguarding inquiries that they're doing, Michelle's talked about some trends in Shropshire, but in Talford and Rekin, the most safeguarding inquiries that they've been carrying out at the start of this year have actually been around neglect, then followed by financial abuse, and then the third most inquiries that they've been doing are around physical abuse. So that's mm. the sort of trend that they, they've been seeing in Talford and Rekin. And I think if you look at the NHS digital data for adult safeguarding that suggests that across England as a whole neglect is the most dealt with as a section 42 inquiry by adult safeguarding so Telford mm -hmm. kind of um, lines up with that so it's really interesting from a Shropshire perspective that Shropshire are largely dealing with things like domestic abuse and self-neglect and I guess we could have a whole other conversation Michelle couldn't we about the reasons for that really and you know is it down to our population because many of the people experiencing domestic abuse in Shropshire could be older people experiencing domestic abuse, which is what we're talking about today. Um, and, you know, people who are self-neglecting. Is it down to things like, you know, the fact that Shropshire Council has done an awful lot of training on domestic abuse, which means that workers and volunteers generally have a really good understanding and are able to spot the signs of it and support people to deal with it. So sometimes unpicking the reasons why we see these trends mm. is really quite interesting, isn't it? Um, so, you know, if you do want to know more about data, you can go on the NHS digital um, website. And I think Penn has just dropped the link into the chat there for you to have a look at. And you can have a look at county by county what's happening. And I think that can be really interesting sometimes to sort of start unpicking that data. And Telford um, Safeguard and Partnership and the local authority are doing quite a lot of work at the moment around unpicking data. So when we say, for example, in Talford and Rekin, the neglect is the one that's dealt with most as an adult safeguarding issue, what does that neglect look like? What's happening under that umbrella of neglect? Because neglect is quite wide, really, as a subject, isn't it? Is it around medication? Is it around uh, hydration, nutrition? Is it around pressure area care? Michelle mentioned that earlier. You know, what does that neglect look like? Because ideally, what we want to be doing is working to prevent abuse happening in the first place. And if we're going to work to prevent it, we really need to have a good understanding, don't we, of what that kind of abuse looks like um, when you start to unpick it, really, so that we can put things in place to try and raise people's awareness of it and prevent it happening in the first place. And then I was just going to say something about self-neglect as well. Um, I co-chair with the Principal Social Worker for Shropshire Council, the Safeguarding Partnership in Shropshire's group around self-neglect. So their strategic priority is um, supporting self-neglect and looking at that as a subject. And we are in the process currently of reviewing our self-neglect guidance for Shropshire. And what we recognise in Shropshire in particular is that self-neglect happens to people who might not traditionally seem to fall under the umbrella of being adults with care and support needs who might access the safeguarding service. So people, for example, who may be homeless or people who may have issues around substance or alcohol misuse. And they are the areas that in particular we want to include in our uh, guidance when it's revised. And we are working on it at the moment to really make sure that it is as comprehensive as possible and that it captures everybody that kind of needs that support through safeguarding, really. Thank you, Karen. Um, Karen, can I just ask, uh, just keeping on the theme of neglect, whether within um, Telford and, and Regan, the neglect, is, is it mostly in terms of neglect within people's own home settings or as Michelle mentioned within um, institutional, you know, residential yeah. nursing home settings? Or I... Maybe you won't separate yeah, I don't have figures in front of me from Tarford and Rican about neglect in specific, but what I do have is figures around um, older people, and they've classed this as uh, someone who's 65 and over. So the safeguarding inquiries in Tarford and Rican, approximately 40% of those safeguarding inquiries involving adults who are 65 and over originate from abuse that's happened in someone's own home. And approximately 34% of those um, safeguarding inquiries are about... Um, abuse of older people that's happened within care home settings, permanent care home settings. And I think that kind of is reflected in the national data from NHS Digital, that largely abuse still happens in the person's own home. But there are other sectors where people could experience abuse, and that will obviously include neglect as well. So I don't know, does that answer your question, Sarah? Yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. I was just, there was a question that came up in the chat 
um, function. I don't know whether you saw it, Karen. I'm not sure whether it was in relation to um, what you were saying. Um, it was, um, can we have an update on the progress of the research the OPC did on the abuse of older men? Now, um, maybe that's not related to... Um... OK, so I think what they're talking about is the Older Persons Commissioner. So, oh, right. um, so in Wales, in Wales, they have a role, a specific role called the Older Persons Commissioner. And that role is very specific in terms of championing the rights of older people. Um, I don't personally um, have an update on that, but I can tell you that <laughs> the Older Persons Commissioner's role in Wales is incredibly proactive. And for a number of years, what they've done in Wales, which I think we were a little bit behind, if I'm honest, in England, perhaps I shouldn't say that out loud. Um, I do live in Wales, though, by the way. So just to say that out loud, um, the Older Persons Commissioner did quite a lot of work identifying things like the issue of the abuse of older people, which traditionally I think has been more of a hidden issue. And many people may assume that older people don't experience domestic abuse. So I think in Wales, that role really kind of championed that idea that actually we need to have an awareness that older people can also experience domestic abuse. This is not just something that happens to younger people. And there are really kind of complicating factors, I think, if you think about the abuse of older people. So for example, um, who experiences the abuse? But not only that, complicating factors around dependency in terms of care provision. And I don't know whether anybody is familiar with um, an organisation in Wales called Dewey's Choice. There's an organisation and they're based at Aberystwyth University called Dewey's Choice, and they've done some really interesting work. Um, and they've got a load of researches on uh, research documents on their website and resources that are really helpful, which people might want to look at. And the one I was thinking of was um, a document called Domestic Abuse in the Coexistence of Dementia which people may be interested to have a look at. And although Dewey's Choice are an organisation based in Wales, the law and everything that's outlined in that document, um, that resource, toolkit, if you like, is actually reflected for England and Wales. So if anyone hasn't had the chance to have a look at that document, and I think um, there's probably a link that somewhere that could be dropped into the chat for that. Yeah. Um, and there it is. Look at that. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as if by magic. <laughs> As if by magic, the link appears. Um, it's really useful. And they've got a number of really useful um documents on that website which are specifically looking at the abuse of older people so I'd really recommend that equally people could go on the um, older people's commissioners website in Wales and have a look at the recent work that they've been doing I don't specifically have an update I'm afraid on their research currently but I know they are incredibly proactive okay many thanks Karen uh, for your for that input um Elizabeth before we move on maybe to um the next question um just come back to you in terms of from what you've heard from Michelle and Karen um, about prevalence of you know particular types of abuse in in their respective areas how does that compare do you feel with the calls that we're getting through on the, the helpline I think it's very reflective of the calls that we're getting through on the helpline as we I discussed during the PowerPoint the all calls across all areas of abuse have increased significantly over this year including financial and, and neglect as well um, and they are very prevalent abuse types that we have to support here in Hourglass. Um, yeah, I, th I think it is very prevalent for us to, to know that and to be able to put our service out there for people to be able to access and get the support that they need. And are we um within the helpline able to identify any specific trends by region or nation or in the work that's coming through or is that something that we, we don't break it down yes we, we would be able to work out those specific i just don't have them on me at this moment in time but we do go through our stats and we work out where the calls are coming through and, and who we're assisting in those different areas Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. Then moving on to our second question, and again, maybe just in the same running order of uh, start with you, Michelle, what can we do to prevent the abuse of older people around things, particularly like financial abuse from families? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think the main thing is making sure they're aware of how to protect themselves as much as possible. So giving them the information and the knowledge of how to protect their assets and, and also about notifying and telling somebody if something doesn't quite feel right. And it's really difficult with families because we know that generally 
with financial abuse, the abuser is a family member. And, and that's generally really difficult because that means quite often that it's a son or a daughter or a grandchild or somebody approaching them or taking money from them. Um, or we have things like setting up credit cards in their names and all sorts of a number of ways that they can financially abuse a relative. And sometimes they don't recognise that that's happening. So it could be that um, you have a discussion with them to say, do, do you know, it could be, for example, we had a recent case not so long ago where there was two daughters and there was a concern from the one daughter that the other daughter had been accessing funds. And it was a conversation with mum to say, have you given permission for this mum? Do you know that this is happening? Um, and she wasn't aware. So, you know, she, because she'd given um, kind of trust and, and responsibility to her daughter to help with her financial affairs, she wasn't aware of what was happening. So I think it is arming people with the information of how to protect themselves as much as possible. So ensuring that they're ready um, for when maybe they're not in a position to manage their own finances and have oversight of what, what's happening with their finances, such as a power attorney or a deputy ship order, um, pointing them in the right direction, um, you know, to help like such as Hourglass about how can I can, this is happening, where can I get the appropriate help? Um, what we do when we do a safeguard and inquiry with an individual is we look at a safety plan and we look at empowering them to help themselves as much as possible. So helping them understand and realise what's happening and arming them with the information so that they can put those plans in place to stop things from happening. So it could be changing bank accounts, um, you know, cancelling Pacific cards. Um, having conversations with family members is tricky um, because often, as I mentioned, um, they don't want to raise that situation mm -hmm. with a loved one. You know, they don't want to believe that that could be happening from somebody that they trust. So it, it, it's not it's always an easy thing to address with financial abuse. It can be very tricky. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Michelle. Karen, is there anything you'd like to add in relation to financial abuse or anything that you've come across within the, your particular organisation? Yeah, and I think, again, it is back to having conversations, isn't it? So our providers, I think, are quite good at having conversations with people about, you know, where they can get help and support and just generally raising awareness, really, of financial abuse. And I think a lot of people don't like to think that someone close to them in their life would be the person who is financially abusing them. So um, I recently went to deliver a training session in an evening time to Trafalgar and ladies group. And they asked me to go and talk to them specifically about adult safeguarding issues. And it's amazing how much information there is contained within, uh, within the community already. But I think it never does any harm to promote things. You know, you've mentioned, Michelle, already things like lasting powers of attorney. How many people have thought about that before they really need to uh, in terms of future planning? We don't necessarily have those future planning conversations, do we? So I think it's about promoting those things, raising awareness of it. And then we've got some really great resources online. I don't know if anyone's gone on the National Trading Standards Initiative Friends Against Scams website. That's a really great website. And you can actually take a short online course. Anybody can do it and become a friend against scams. And the idea behind that website is they really want to raise awareness out in our communities about scams. Um, so, you know, it's not just uh, about family uh, abusing people financially. It's also about that opportunity for scams as well, I think. And, you know, scams are much more likely to happen if somebody is lonely and isolated. So it's about having those conversations and really, I think as well, you know, trying to address those issues around loneliness and isolation, because if you've got people to talk to in your life, if you have got a concern, you're more likely to address that at an early stage rather than leaving it until it gets into a big issue. And I think the problem with, you know, financial abuse and scams, whoever's perpetrating that, if you like, um, it can get to a point where a lot of money has gone. And it can be very difficult to get that back then. So, you know, ideally, it's about raising awareness across our communities and society about financial abuse, because it is quite a big issue. And I don't think we're always fully aware of the scale of it. And if you've read anything on the news this morning, you may well have seen that the police today and tomorrow are texting 70,000 individuals 
um, because they have those individuals' phone numbers and there's been some kind of large-scale investigation. The Metropolitan Police have got people's phone numbers and very little detail other than that. But they want to text people to warn them that they've potentially been a victim of a scam and they're asking them then to report to Action Fraud, that scam. So, yeah, I mean, you're more likely to be financially abused by somebody who's close to you. But in terms of things like loneliness and isolation, I think that's where scams and things have a, have a role to play. And, you know, these people are incredibly clever. And um, we have got some links that you might want to have a look at today, raising awareness of scams. And I think they're really useful to use with people in conversation. So there's a lot produced by the National Centre for Post-Qualifying Social Work, Professor Keith Brown. If you ever heard him talk, he's done a lot of work on this. And we've got a link to some of their resources and um, things like the power of persuasive language, the type of language that scammers will use to extract money from people and um, all kinds of useful resources. And like I said, I'd also um, recommend the Friends Against Scams website if you generally want to have conversations with people about being safe and being aware of latest scams. Um, but also have conversations with people that, you know, someone in our life who we trust ultimately could be the person who um, takes advantage of that. So who do you make your lasting power of attorney, I guess, is a, an important mm -hmm. question to, to think about. It needs to be someone that you trust, doesn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Karen. And Elizabeth, just um, do you want to maybe just input in terms of what um, the experience is coming through the helpline and through to our glass on financial abuse? Absolutely, yes. I mean, it's very reflective of what Michelle and Karen have both mentioned in regards to wanting to raise more awareness around the scam concerns that uh, people are calling in in regards to, um, and also public recognition and bystander intervention as well. I think there needs to be more public understanding and awareness raised around there too. Um, and also accessibility. We're finding a lot of our callers are, don't have accessibility to the banks anymore. A lot of the local banks are shutting down, so they're not able to go and visit the bank in person, or even if they do visit the bank in person they're having to go with somebody because of mobility issues not being able to drive or get them themselves so I think the bank needs to be more aware of the abuse that may be occurring um, and be more vigilant when people are coming in and if they're being brought in by somebody or if somebody's speaking over the top of them and making those decisions on their behalf um, digital literacy as well we have a lot of clients that call in and say well suddenly my my bank statements have stopped coming in and I don't have access to my account anymore and I don't have my card because it's all now online and it's so much easier for a perpetrator to just stop them accessing all of those things and I think the digital literacy or, or a little bit of training and awareness and accessibility out there for older people would be wonderful um so yeah I, th I think that's everything I've got for that, for that question Sarah thank you thanks Elizabeth and I suppose before we just leave that particular topic of financial abuse um if I just say to folk on the webinar um, last month's webinar was on financial abuse and it's available now to download on the um, Knowledge Bank website and that was with um, someone from Dankster Bank and um, someone from Adult Safeguarding um, actually here at, in Northern Ireland. So it's well worth a watch if you're, you know, if financial abuse is something that you're particularly um, interested in and just hearing a little bit more about that. Before we move on to um, our third question, um, a couple of questions have can come in in just the question and answer box, which is terrific. And the first one, Michelle, I, don't, I hope that you have picked it up. It was actually from um, Kate and it was around the increase in the number of domestic abuse cases in the Shropshire area um, and citing a case where someone had been really um, within a domestic abuse situation for 50 years and hadn't shared that any information with anyone until obviously her husband was admitted to hospital and then was about to be discharged home. So I don't know Michelle if you want if you've had a chance to look at that question coming in and whether you want to to make any comment I think you're right and I think we do see occasionally cases very similar to this situation that's been put in the, in the questions um, where an individual you know we get involved with them they, they're quite some couples isolate themselves quite a lot especially when there's perhaps an abusive relationship happening what we see very often is one of the one of the um, individuals might have dementia 
so cognitively can no longer um, kind of keep themselves safe and, and, and challenge um, the, their, their partner. So one example is we get quite a lot of individuals that have been in a volatile relationship probably all of their married life um, and have probably been able to keep themselves as safe as they possibly can. But as they get older and frailer and maybe their cognition changes, they don't have that ability to do that. Um, but we have seen that both equally, female and male, where they've been in abusive situations and have needed us to support them to get out of that. Um, you know, a lot of coercion and control happens when individuals get older, you know, then they're stopped from seeing family, specific family members, for example. We see that a lot where maybe it might be a second marriage and their children are from a previous relationship as well. That does happen. But yes, well, we absolutely do see it coming yeah. more and more as time goes on. Um, or maybe it's just because people, as Karen mentioned before, the providers that, that we have in Shropshire, people are a lot more aware of it, so pick up on things a lot more. You know, we'll get care agencies referring in because they've delivered care in the property and have noticed mm. that something's not quite right. Um, and, you know, so I, I think that's probably one of the reasons why there's a rise as well, because it's more awareness yeah. and understanding. Which is excellent. It's mm. yeah, it's, which is exactly what we want to be happening across um, all four nations, because it, it is so important that um, people feel confident enough to to report when they think something isn't right. Thanks, Michelle. And just another question that has come in that um, Karen, um, maybe you would like to, uh, to answer. Uh, and it was around, is it time for an Older People's Commissioner in England? And I know you referenced the Older People's Commissioner in Wales. It's a really interesting question because the question in the chat is talking about people's attitudes to older people and that that sometimes is linked to, you know, maybe why abuse happens because of our attitude and potential discrimination towards older people. I think it's a really interesting question. My, I've got two two answers to it, really. My gut is telling me that we shouldn't really need to have an older people's commissioner because we shouldn't really need to single out and treat older people differently. So why would they therefore need to have a commissioner? However, one of the things that the Older People's Commissioner does, I think really well in Wales, um, is that they really spend time listening to and collaborating with older people to understand the issues that older people specifically experience and what is important to people. And ultimately they spend quite a lot of time challenging discrimination so challenging the way, for example, that older people are portrayed in things like the media. Um, and I remember a load of training sessions being delivered by the Older uh, People's Commissioner's Office, even around things like um, when you're driving down the road and you see a sign, a crossing sign, where you'll see an older person crossing and that older person always has a walking stick. It's about changing those um, visions of people who are older people and saying that actually what we want to have is a really positive view of older age and that people have a really good experience of their older age. And the Older People's Commissioner in Wales says that, you know, Wales is a good place to age because they're really kind of tackling and trying to challenge those discriminatory attitudes. And the question the chat talks about, unless we address those attitudes, abusive behaviour may not stop because we need to address those. And I think, you know, on, on those kind of points, yes, I would say it would be useful for England to also have that role of an older people's commissioner because it is that kind of championing role and it's a listening role as well. So it's really there to listen to the voice of people. So... Yeah, although I think in many ways we shouldn't have to have the role. Yeah. In many ways, in Wales, I think it's had a really positive impact, actually. So, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Karen. And um, we have another question. And Elizabeth, maybe you would like to respond to this. Um, Lucy is asking if you have any tips in terms of um, how you manage the discussion around financial abuse with someone who is suffering from dementia which obviously makes it even more difficult 
Know, yes, it can make it difficult. Unfortunately, with the capacity lost there, it would be very difficult to liaise with the individual. And um, obviously, fluctuating capacity, we take that into consideration as well. So um, in the first instant, I would try and advise them and raise their awareness in regards to financial abuse, maybe see if they have a relative, a close relative that they can trust in, that they could discuss about their concerns with the financial abuse. Um, keep their bank cards to themselves. Don't let them out to anybody else. You know, review their bank statements alone. Um, the online shopping can be done now, so you don't need to hand your card to somebody and send them down to the shop. It can all be done online quite simply. Um, there are social prescribers and advocates out there that can help somebody with paperwork who are professional individual um, who will be, you know, um, um, they won't take into consideration the, um, the person's personal life or anything like that. They will be independent. Um, so not making the decision, um, not based on the individual's well-being, um, which we find a lot of people who do financially abuse go against that. And they will not be making the decision on the best person's interest. Um, checking their savings, um, cancelling any spare cards or, or any accounts that they may have open. Um, and do not leave your valuables or any money in view. Uh, don't sign any blank checks or anything like that like that and just try and work with the individual to raise that awareness so if if your friend was in this situation and they were experiencing this what advice would you give them and then try and give them their own advice and see how they take it and say well this is the experience that you're going through so so how are we going to help you now and what can we do going forward thank you elizabeth for that okay moving on i'm conscious of time and there's loads of questions that we have in and loads coming in, which is absolutely terrific. Um, the next question um, is around, do older people experience mate crime? Um, and Karen, I think this uh, is something that you're going to respond to. And I know that you have a short video, I think which Penny is going to, to show. So hopefully that works for us. Of course it will. Um, so just before we have the film, though, Penny, I think it might be useful just to set the scene for it a little bit, really. So mate crime, traditionally, we might think about mate crime as something that may happen to, for example, younger adults with a learning disability, because the idea about mate crime is that somebody recognises an individual who they perceive as being vulnerable, lonely or isolated in some way, and they set about befriending that person. But they befriend that person actually in order to exploit them in some way. In the last question in the chat about somebody whose friend potentially was doing their shopping, you know, this is how it can start. So it can start off with someone volunteering to do something that's really nice for the person. And over a period of time, that can build up to a point where the person really trusts them. And then the exploitation might start. And we had quite a well-documented case in Shropshire of an older person being a victim of mate crime. And the reason it was a well-documented case was because it was successfully prosecuted through criminal justice systems. And this was a female in North Shropshire who befriended an older male neighbour. And I think it was over a period, it was a long period of about nine years. And over that nine year period, that person was found guilty in court and received a custodial sentence for stealing in the region of £80,000 from the neighbour. And the issue, I think, with mate crime is often that the person who's experiencing that often doesn't recognise that they're being financially abused because they genuinely believe that person is a good friend to them. So this came to light through an anonymous tip off, actually. And um, when it was investigated by the police, the man himself who'd experienced that um, financial abuse because of mate crime was horrified to think that it was his really good friend who had done that to him. So it's a real undermining of trust then, isn't it? If someone that you should have been able to trust is the person who's financially abused you. And we did say earlier, didn't we, with financial abuse, that it is most likely to be someone that you're familiar with or you know. Now, in order to address this, there are a few good resources. So there's a resource online by an organisation called the Association for Real Change, and it's called Friend or Fake. And that's a good conversation opener. It was designed to have conversations with adults with learning disabilities, but equally you could adapt it to have conversations with other people. And it does start, like you were just saying, Elizabeth, it starts to get people to question, is this person really your friend or do they have a different motivation? In addition, Shropshire Safeguard and Community Partnership and Talford and Rekin um, Safeguarding Partnership, we've adapted um, a short animation called Tricky Friends, which was produced by Norfolk Safeguarding Adults Board, and they've been very kind and let other safeguarding partnerships across the country adapt it for their own purposes. The reason we've adapted this film for our purpose is because we want to raise people's awareness of mate crime as an issue. 
if you think about the pandemic period and the impact that has had, particularly on older people, okay, loneliness, isolation, potentially in some ways increased vulnerabilities in some cases, that means something like mate crime is more likely to be an issue because it is about identifying someone who is lonely and isolated. Okay, so um, without further ado, shall we have a watch of the Tricky Friends animation? And you can see if you think it will be useful in your context mm -hmm. to um, support an opening, really, of a conversation. Having good friends is one of the things that can make life really great. But friendships can be tricky. And even a really good friend can make us feel bad sometimes. So it's good to talk about our friends with our carers and our family. It's wise to talk about the kinds of things that you do together. It's nice to share good memories and it can be really helpful to get some advice if you don't think your friends are making you happy right now. These are some of the things that you should talk about with your carer before it reaches boiling point. If a friend plays a trick on you, or tries to make you angry, and then says that it's all a joke. If they call you names you don't like, either face to face or online. If someone asks you to share pictures or videos with them over the internet. Or if a friend wants to use your cash card. Something else that's good to talk about is if your friend asks to borrow something and then doesn't bring it back. Or if they bring people to your house that you don't know without your permission. It's good to have some rules about what a friend is and isn't allowed to do. For example, they should never refuse to leave if you ask them to, or ask you to look after something, or even deliver it somewhere without telling you the truth about what it is. They shouldn't take money without asking or make you pay for things for them like food or alcohol. They should never make you feel scared, out of control or like you can't say no when they want you to do something. A good friend should never ask you to keep secrets about the way they behave. Talking about faithful friends with carers or family is a nice way to relive some of your favourite memories and to make sure that your friends are still being good friends. An important thing to remember is that a good friend is someone that makes you feel safe, someone that makes you laugh and is interested in the same kinds of things that you are. So to finish, just remember that it's great to have friends but if they do or say anything that makes you feel bad, you should talk about what's going on with someone you trust, like a family member, neighbour, key worker, or anyone else who provides you with support. If you can't find someone you can trust, in Shropshire, you can always call one of the numbers on screen and speak to someone who can help. Thanks, Penny. And I think, I don't know what you thought about the film, but that's very short animation. And it really is a kind of conversation starter, isn't it? Because it opens up that conversation about, you know, how do you feel about this? Do you have anyone in your life who might fit under that umbrella, et cetera, et cetera. And they're not easy conversations to have with people, are they? Bearing in mind that if you are very lonely and isolated, that person who has befriended you and you genuinely believe they're a friend, you may not have many other people in your life who you can turn to. So sometimes, you know, we do need to think about addressing loneliness and isolation uh, in a lot of the situations that we've talked about today. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, that's, I think it's a very important issue. And I think something made uh, sort of crime is something that we don't think about in relation to, to older people. But as you say, uh, particularly with the cost of living, uh, crisis and the prevalence of financial abuse. Um, it's 
it's certainly one area that um, everyone working in the field of adult safeguarding needs to be very aware of. Um, yeah, and I think just, particularly Sarah as well, you know, going through the pandemic period, that pandemic, it really has exasperated the issues of loneliness and isolation, hasn't it? So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are some other questions in the question and answer box. Penny has, and I, I don't know whether, um, I'm not seeing them at the minute. Uh, Let's see. Um, um, in relation to financial abuse, again, I, I don't know whether the panelists can actually um, see them. Um, but um, so I think maybe what we will do in relation to the time that we have left on the webinar is that we'll respond to those questions um, afterwards, if that's okay with um, the folk who have raised them. In the second Can I just part say though, Sarah, yeah. sorry, just to interrupt very briefly, um, there was a really interesting question from Simon in the chat from a banking perspective. So Simon's saying, apart from training awareness and flexible processes, what else would you like to see banks doing? Traditionally, you think of domestic abuse impacting younger people at TSB Bank. Our Do What Matters plan focuses on support for victim survivors of domestic abuse through the lens of customers, colleagues and communities. And I think it's really interesting to reflect on perhaps after today, what else would we like to see banks doing? And Simon, hopefully you're open to a conversation after the session from a TSB perspective um, around that, because obviously, you know, there's probably quite a lot of knowledge within this session today around mm. issues of domestic abuse and older people um, that might be relevant, that, that could be taken forward. So hopefully that is something that we can kind of think about and reflect on after yeah. the session and come back if that is it okay? Yeah, absolutely, Karen, and we'll ensure that that's followed up with Simon. And I would just say again, um, the previous webinar um, last month, uh, when we had a representative from Danske Bank, and there's a lot of useful information that uh, people might find useful in terms of different types of accounts and things, and what the banks are doing to train their staff to, to pick up um, on issues where there's concern about financial abuse. So again, it's maybe another area that for a future webinar, we could maybe expand that in terms of, of domestic abuse. And thank you, Simon, for your, your question. And um, Sarah, can I just interrupt one more time? Sorry, yep. I'm a bit annoying, aren't I? Um, Laura's asked a question in the chat and Laura's saying that, um, I come across this quite a lot when visiting older people from a fire service perspective. And I think she's talking about mate, the idea of mate crime. I wonder mm -hmm. if I should be questioning the relationship more. So I think yeah. if anything is sort of telling you in your gut that something is maybe not quite right here, something's maybe a bit off, it doesn't necessarily make sense or add up, then I would say it's always a good idea to explore a little bit more and use that professional curiosity. Being respectfully nosy is a good idea if you think something's possibly a little bit off. And I think, you know, generally, in our roles we are just generally interested in people aren't we and I think if you've got something that you think you've got a bit of a question mark it's always worth following that up I'll be quiet absolutely now. absolutely thanks Karen and actually in the next few questions probably links into that because the next question that we want to address is when is it deemed suitable to raise a safeguarding concern without the consent of the person um, and um, maybe Michelle, you would like to start off with that and we'll give Karen a break because she's had a, a long go. <laughs> she has, thanks Sarah. Um, so as it's always good practice, best practice to try and gain consent where possible, but sometimes it's not appropriate and it's not, it's not able to. Example, if the person lacks capacity now around the specific type of abuse that they might be experiencing. Um, Generally, I mean, you should always follow your own company's policy around, um, you know, raising a concern and breaking consent if you've not got it. Um, but if you have got serious concerns for an individual um, in, in an emergency situation or a life threatening situation, then it may warrant that you share that information without their consent. Um, from a social work perspective, um, 
if we're with an individual and they disclose something that's concerning, then it's best practice to explain to the individual that, you know, what, what would you like me to do about that? If they're not able to, or they're not happy to give their consent for you to share that information, then I would seek support from a line manager maybe, or your safeguarding team. You can always ring the safeguarding the team at, at the council or hourglass maybe for some advice and say, I've been disclosed this information. The person doesn't want me to do anything about it or I don't believe the individual can give consent. What should I do? Mm -hmm. um, but it's always worth asking for that help before you go ahead and share the information first. So just check the guidance and, and, and get some advice about it. Obviously, if the individual lacks capacity, then we need to be considering the relevant legislation, the Mental Capacity Act, and whether or not it's in their best interest for you to share that information on their behalf, it's because they might not be able to get out of the, the abusive situation themselves without somebody stepping in and making that decision for them. Okay, so I would always, the Sky have got some really good, so the Social Care Institute, Institute of Excellence have got some really good advice on their website about what to do with sharing information around safeguarding of adults. Um, I'll try and put the link in the chat in a second to that. Okay, but, it, but yeah, it's some really Michelle. useful information. And Karen, is there anything that you would like to add to Michelle's comments on you know, when it's yeah. deemed suitable to raise a concern without someone's consent. Yeah, I mean, we've got a whole agenda for adult safeguarding, haven't we, called making mm -hmm. safeguarding personal, where the person is always at the centre, so our starting point is always with them and what are their views about the situation, what they like to do about it. But equally, as Michelle has said, there may be times when it would be described as being in the public interest to raise that concern uh, without the person's consent. And if it's safe to do so... If that's the decision that's been made and it's in line with guidance that it's in the public interest to raise that concern, even though the adult would say no, best practice would be that if it's safe to do so, to still have that conversation with the adult so they are fully aware of why you're raising that concern, even though they're not consenting, where it's safe to do so. Yeah, I think it's yeah. really important that we involve the adult and making safeguarding personal is a really important agenda for adult safeguarding. We're working with adults, aren't we? Yeah. It's about involving the adult in all of those decisions and discussions. It is about their life, ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. And Elizabeth, in terms of um, your experience through the helpline, um, I'm assuming there are occasions where perhaps um, calls come through where people aren't giving consent, but there is um, it's deemed necessary to to pass on the information. Mm, yes, absolutely. There will be times where calls come in um, and there's concern over immediate or serious risk to health or life. Um, and service protocol does mean that we would have to raise um, through the, the duty of care of our service means that we would raise a safeguarding concern. Or as Michelle said, I would go and liaise with my line man manager first and discuss the case and, and what concerns I do have. Um, if yeah. there was a risk of harm to the vulnerable adult or, or a child in the property, maybe. Um, and then as well as Karen mentioned, the capacity as well as is um, I think everybody's hit the nail on the head there, but yes, um, we do yeah. we do assist with phone calls where we would have to immediately address those safety concerns. Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I know we have a number of questions um, coming through, and I think we're up to ten now. Um, and if any of the panelists, uh, my difficulty is actually seeing the questions, other than Penny pops them up on the, the screen. But if uh, the panelists could maybe have, um, I, I know that you're you're checking. Um, and there's Penny has popped one up very well. Done. Um, and it is uh, the question that has been asked is to if someone could sort of outline what happens when a safeguarding referral is actually made. I think that was went down again, but I think that's what it was. If someone could outline the process when a safeguarding referral is made into the system. And maybe Michelle, you'd like to um, address that. Okay. So in Shropshire Council, we've got a specific safeguarding team that deal with safeguarding concerns for adults. So um, you can make a referral online or ringing through to our um, first point of contact centre as well. So that referral would be directed straight to the safeguarding team. 
where they would then look at the content of the referral and prioritise how to respond. Um, first of all, it's called lateral checks, um, which, which falls within the safeguarding process. So lateral checks is where they do as much as possible um, to gather information in relation to the concern that's been raised. So that could be contacting the individual, contacting the referrer, um, contacting any, any other relevant person, such as the GP or the care agency. Um, and then they would gather the information and then decide what should happen next. That involves, as Karen mentioned before, speaking with the individual first and foremost, wherever possible, about what do they want to happen, um, and then deciding a plan with that individual on what should happen next. So it could be that they're helped to raise um, to the police their concerns, um, that maybe they're signposted to a relevant service um, to support them. It could be that it, it goes through to a full inquiry um, and then that means that um, uh, one of the social care practitioners would visit, do an actual inquiry where they gather all of the evidence, all of the information, and then agree with the individual what a safeguarding plan might look like for them. And if it progresses to a plan, then they work with maybe the social work team. They might refer the individual through to a care act assessment um, or for a care assessment assessment depending on what the individual person mm -hmm. if they're a care or, or, an, or a client um, and then they would review that plan and see how that plan is working see if that individual has been able to keep themselves as safe as possible so as Karen said it's about working with the individual to keep themselves safe empowering them to take control as much as possible over what is happening and giving them the knowledge and the skills to do that. Okay, thanks, Michelle. And I don't know whether you've had a, a chance to, to see the question that was relating to that, but I think the person popping the question um, into the question and answer box was, I think, frustrated because they'd made a referral and couldn't get any feedback on what actually was happening. Um, but I mean, obviously, we don't, you don't have all the, the details, but you've very clearly outlined in terms of an adult safeguarding referral, what the process it would be. Tricky. It is tricky sometimes because we get referrals from a number of people, it could be a neighbour that's concerned. Um, and obviously, we have to think about sharing of information and what information we can mm -hmm. share. So sometimes we don't necessarily feedback to the referrer because it yeah. might be inappropriate to do so. And we don't have the consent to share information. Sometimes it might be that we just give them a call and say, thank you for your concern, and we will follow it up, just to reassure them um, that you know the council is looking into it. Um, so it is difficult because we realize mm -hmm. and recognize completely that somebody's contacted us for a reason because they're worried about an individual yeah. and they're not just going to contact us forget about it they're going to want some kind of response yes. but sometimes it's not appropriate to do that you know we can't share information with the individual depending on who they are yeah absolutely i appreciate that michelle and then following on from that karen maybe if you would like to, to take this question what happens when an individual does not qualify um, for safeguarding? And I think, uh, Karen, you're maybe wanting to respond to another question that has come in. So if you want to do that first, that's fine. OK, so the, the question that I saw in the Q&A was, um, I'm just tr trawling back through it, um, someone who'd done some a work as an engagement officer with a local health watch organisation, and they were doing some quality assurance reviews of Section 42 Care Act, making safeguarding personal referrals to the council. Mm -hmm. um, and is that a useful thing to have a kind of outside agency to do? I think in Shropshire um, and in Telford, we do quite a lot of work around thinking about that so in Shropshire as part of the work of the Shropshire Safeguarding Community Partnership we've just done a wide range of multi-agency case audits 
Mm. And those case audits are specifically looking at quality, what happened uh, with the um, safeguarding concern coming in, what agencies were involved and all of those kind of things. And one of the key questions is always, how is the adult involved in that situation? Is their voice heard in that safeguarding inquiry? What are the outcomes? So I think that work is going on, but I think it's a really good point. And I think, you know, in terms of making sure that the adult's voice, i.e. in line with the making safeguarding personal agenda is heard, yeah, I do sometimes think there's there's a role for um, third sector organisations, you know, and Health Watch does a lot of uh, really important work in each area of, of England. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I would think that's important. Obviously, there are those issues, aren't there, uh, around confidentiality. And I guess the thing is, if you're going back to people who've been through the safeguarding process and thinking about how they felt about that process, it's a very fine balance, isn't it, between working with the person and understanding their views, but also the risk of re-traumatising somebody by talking back through that situation. So I think it needs to be done in a way that isn't traumatising for that person. And it does sometimes take quite a lot of thought to do that. So I do think it's a useful thing to do. And I think, you know, we really try to develop in Telford and Recon in Shropshire a learning culture around safeguarding. And I don't think anyone on this session would disagree that that's a good idea. <laughs> so I think learning from people's experiences is a really, really important thing. It's just about thinking about how we do that. We do need to engage with adults, definitely. It's something we're addressing right now through our self-neglect group about how we um, get feedback from people about their experience of using services to support them and how uh, how we use workers that already have that rapport to do that piece of work so that we're not kind of stepping in and, and traumatizing people so yeah it's a really good point okay and then do you want to address what happens when an individual doesn't qualify for safeguarding support yeah I can what start it off but I think I think Michelle will probably want to finish it off yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I guess from a point of view I mean the care act lays out the criteria for adult safeguarding so what the care act says quite clearly is adult safeguarding we use that process when we've got an adult who has needs for care and support who we believe is experiencing or at risk of abuse or neglect and because of those care and support needs they're unable to protect themselves from the risk or experience of abuse or neglect so that's what the care act quite clearly outlines and clearly not every adult in England who is experiencing abuse will be someone who has care and support needs. So our first port of call always when we're supporting somebody is to think about, can we use our adult safeguarding process to support this person? Or do we think about other access and opportunities? So it may well be that they need an assessment under the Care Act. It may well need, they need some support around things like assessment of capacity to make specific decisions in their life. Maybe we signpost into other resources. So we've got Shropshire Domestic Abuse Services locally that goes across Shropshire and Telford and Rekin. You know, do we need to support somebody to access that particular service? Where do they need to go? So there are lots of things that we can do to support somebody. So if we did get local authority calls coming in, you know, about safeguarding and it didn't fit that criteria, I don't think anybody's going to say it doesn't fit the criteria. Goodbye. It's about thinking, OK, it doesn't fit our safeguarding criteria. What else can we do to support this person? Where else can we suggest that they access some support? So it's always about saying we recognise there might be an issue here. If we're not going to deal with it through safeguarding, where else can we do that? And how else can we support that person? It could be, you know, a police intervention is necessary. It could be that they need to access services or want to access services and victim support. Perhaps they might want some counselling. You know, it could be lots of different things. And I'll hand over to Michelle now um, to see okay. what her thoughts are on that. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. I think, I think you did well there, Karen. <laughs> I think, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if it's not appropriate for safeguarding, then it may be that, for example, if an individual is self-neglecting, maybe on a low level, would they would a, would a Section 9 Care Act assessment help identify ways that they can um, keep themselves well? You know, that, that focusing on well-being rather than maybe the care and support needs, if they're not eligible for that. There's also areas that, you know, for example, if it's a concern raised about a provider or a care home, our commissioning services could, could provide support in their ways through monitoring officers that would attend care homes, for example, or meet with providers and make sure that they put everything in, poss everything in place that they possibly can to be delivering good quality care. Um, and, and following it out that way as commissioners of local services. 
Um, it could be, uh, sorry, Karen, you might have mentioned it, my sound dropped out for a few seconds about advocacy, and uh, I'd already mentioned that. So um, I think somebody's asked a question about advocacy as well. And uh, you're right, you know, we need to use advocacy more because, as I'd already mentioned earlier on, sometimes people don't want the support of us or the police or um, you know, hourglass, you know, they, they don't they want somebody completely independent. So um one one area is there's a, a lack of advocacy services um that you know they are very stretched um, again like somebody mentioned in the in the question that um, yeah. you know the number of referrals coming through makes it difficult to kind of address those in a timely way. So um, I think pretty much Karen's covered it, but those are the yeah. other suggestions that I would say, really, that we could support an individual through those routes as well. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Um, mindful that we're coming up to near the end of the webinar and we <laughs> have a few more questions to get through. So in the next, I'm going to put sort of two questions together and I'm going to come to Elizabeth first and then to um, Karen and then to Michelle and put in the two questions together because I think our panellists have referenced the answers to these in relation to other questions. But um, we were asked, were there, um, are there any risks in terms of the abuse of older people arising from the current cost of living crisis? And is there anything specifically that you're seeing in the, the Telford, Regan, Shropshire area? And who is most likely to be the person abusing an older person? Um, and I think if our panellists could maybe address those two together, um, we might be able to fit in then maybe another question after that. So Elizabeth, um, just if you would like to address that. Yes, thank you, Sarah. I mean, the risks in terms of um, abuse of an older person in the current cost of living crisis. Um, accessibility is one big problem, um, having um, being economically abused and not having services or anything brought to your property, being cut off from any services or having any care. Um, cost, cost of living crisis is making people concerned about their energy bills, so they're not putting their heating on, um, or they may be cancelling direct debits and paying it ad hocly, which is then going to cause a debt, um, which will build up um, quite significantly over the winter periods. Um, food as well, food banks I know are being um, used quite prolifically by older people at the moment um, because they just don't have the money or the accessibility to go out and buy food. Um, and I've noticed um, on social media, a lot of the shop shelves are starting to empty as well. Eggs and things, basic necessities that people would need aren't there for people to get anymore. So there's there's a lot of concerns around heating, living, and then just generally being well in your day-to-day -day life. If you don't have the accessibility to the heat or the food, your mental um, conditions will turn into a physical condition and then it's just a downward spiral from there. And then that will be a strain on other services if they have to go and see the doctor, the GP, um, NHS, etc. And who is most likely to be the person abusing an older person? From what we found in our studies, it's the older um, child. So either an older son or daughter will be perpetrating abuse against their parent, who they may be providing care towards, um, financially supporting and or abusing, um, and, and also looking to take their property or move them into a care home. So yes, it is generally the older um, child that's abusing a parent. Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, Michelle? Yes, just, just to mirror what Eliz has said there, really, from our, from our statistics in Shropshire for the last kind of last um, year since April this year, is that 126 people um, lived in the same property as, as, and they were the abusers. Um, 104 were the main carer, so that could be husband, wife, son, daughter, you know, relative. Um, and then 30 were known to the victim in other ways, so it could be a neighbour um, or an acquaintance or a carer, maybe. So um, definitely mirror what Liz has just said, that it's, it's very often somebody quite close to the victim. OK, thanks, Michelle. And um, finally, coming across, Karen, is there anything you would like to add to what Elizabeth and Michelle have? Yeah, I mean, I think it's said. quite clear, isn't it, from data and, and from local reflections that it is mm -hmm. more likely to be somebody that you know 
who's the person um, who's going to abuse you as an older person, certainly. But I was just going to add something about the potential cost of living crisis impact. Um, community care reported even as early as August 2022 that already um, people were cancelling their care if they were funding care themselves because they were having to make really difficult choices. And I think if you think about things like self-neglect, there's a potential escalation for some people if they are engaging with services and then they choose to cut that because they're yeah. having to make very difficult decisions. And then, you know, because of what um, Elizabeth and Michelle have said about who is the person likely to harm you, if you think about family members getting into financial difficulties themselves, then there's potential there for them to go and coerce money from mm. older relatives to pay off debts. And we've certainly seen that in the past in relation to things like um, spikes where um, adult children were getting into gambling debt, online gambling, and then going and coercing money from older parents. So certainly um, from an adult safeguarding point of view, we don't know the full scale or the full picture yet, do we? Um, and I guess yeah. as the winter progresses, that might escalate things. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. And that's a very interesting point in terms of people cancelling their care. And it will be interesting to, to keep a watching brief on that if um, local councils are seeing that as a, a growing trend, that would be e extremely worrying um, in terms of the increase in, in levels perhaps of neglect as a result of that. Um, before closing the webinar, because we're now um, up to 11.30 and I know people online will have scheduled um, you know, the time and may have to get on with the rest of their, their day job. Um, we could obviously go on for probably another hour and still not run out of questions because there are many questions coming in. Um, before we close, I just wanted to raise, and we don't have time to discuss it, but I think um, it came in before the, the webinar started and the panellists felt that um, it was a very interesting questions that had come in and it had actually come in from someone who um, previously worked as a solicitor in the United Kingdom but is now uh, has moved to America and is working as uh, an attorney in, in America. But the question that Paul was asking was, do you... Uh, you agree that there should be a criminal offence of elder abuse and if not why not and do you think there should be a mandatory duty to report elder abuse in the same way uh, as child abuse um, and as I say that in itself could be the basis of a future webinar um, but very quickly if I, I just go round for um, just a quick comment on Paul's two questions um, and any final closing remarks, and then we'll close the webinar in the next few minutes. Karen, would you like to start since you're I'll on try the screen? i to be succinct. So the yeah. first yeah. question about should there be a standalone offence of elder abuse? Uh, I don't think there should be. Uh, I think that we need to make good use of the legislation that we already have in place. And I think introducing separate offences can sometimes confuse matters and again, single people out. And potentially, if you did have offences of elder abuse, I think that might actually potentially increase people's vulnerabilities in some way. Um, so I don't I don't think uh, specific criminal offences, standalone offences of elder abuse. And then question B, should there be mandated reporting of abuse of older people? And again, no. I think that um, if you had mandated reporting of adult safeguarding issues per se, that's a different thing. But again, I don't think it should be singled out uh, to be treated differently to the abuse of uh, anybody, really. Yeah. OK, thanks, Karen. Michelle? I think I'd have to agree with exactly what Karen said. I mean, abuse happens of all ages. You know, looking at our statistics from the last two years, in Shropshire, it's kind of equal numbers from the age of 18 all the way up to the age of 94. Um, we do see, a, we, we are seeing a slow rise in that older age group, kind of from 75 to 94, but equally it's all adults, you know, it's not just elder adults that are seeing abuse. So I'd have to agree with Karen. Okay, thanks Michelle and Elizabeth. 
Yes, thank you. I think I'd have to uh, mirror and agree with both comments that have been made. Um, I, I think a standalone offence would um, isolate many people, and I think each case is unique and should be reviewed based on that. And uh, no, I don't think there should be mandatory mandated reporting. Um, we should be following our own um, service provisions and, and using what's already out there and, and making the best of what we can. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. And um, just to close the webinar this morning, can I thank um, all our panelists, as I say, I think we could go on for another hour um, because the questions just keep flooding in, which is terrific that um, there is such interest and uh, people are keen to learn as much as they can and to obviously raise awareness of the issue of the abuse of, of older people. Um, can I just remind everyone that the webinar will be available in the coming days on the Knowledge Bank website. So you can watch it through again or share it uh, with others that other colleagues who maybe haven't been able to join us this morning. And um, thank you again um, to Michelle, Karen and Elizabeth for their input. Um, I think you all gave um, very comprehensive um, answers to um, some quite difficult questions um, and I thank you for your, your commitment to, to doing that and we hope in our glass to, to see everyone again soon at our at our next webinar so just look out for that um, on the website. Many thanks and take care. <laughs>